every single Sunday, for the past couple Sundays, we've had this creed that we have said together. Uh, do we have it? Okay, so can we all say it together? And, and don't repeat after me, let's just say it together. The applied word of God will change my life instantly. I actively embrace and embody its teaching. Pleasing God is my purpose. I will in faith, not sight. I claim promises, pursue passionately, and prosper as my soul prospers. My faith is my proof. In Jesus' name, amen. So the reason why we do that, the reason why we're mentioning this is because this is a time to get into the word. This is the time to know more about Jesus. This is the time to better ourselves. This summer we had a, a series of bettering ourselves. And it was a great series. But now let's just take it out every single week. Every single week, let's better ourselves so that we can get with it. So church, I'm going to read a lot today. Is that okay? We're going to read a lot. So we're going to start out in Genesis 22, verse 1, if you can throw it up on the screen. And it says, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him along with him, his son, Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of the journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther, so we, and we will worship there. And then we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders, while on himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. When he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood, and Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, he replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your own son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram by the horns in the thicket, so he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh Yaira, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb on the mountain, the Lord, it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord said again to Abraham from heaven, this is what the Lord says, because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number, like the stars in the sky and the sand in the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies, and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. Then they returned to the servants and traveled back to Beersheba, where Abraham continued to live. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your scripture. We thank you that we have access to this, this book of life, Lord. Lord, I just pray that as you have given me this word, that you would just continue to give me words of wisdom, that you would allow your spirit to flow through me as we continue on with this. In your name we pray, amen. I hope some of y'all are taking notes because I'm going to get started right away. So I'm going to give you probably three seconds. Okay. My point number one here, and I really want to hammer this home because I think it's, it's something that you need to hear right away for this rest of this message. You have to encounter the Lord if you want to hear his voice louder. Amen. Come on. So pastor has been preaching about this dysfunctional family, this broken family this entire time. And as we look before, it said, the Lord said in a vision, the Lord said, the Lord said, the Lord said. But yet in this passage, it says, God said. And then Abraham replied immediately. Church, let me tell you. When you have that encounter, he had that encounter with him at the tents. He opened up his place to Jesus, to the Lord, not knowing who it was. And then it dawned on him who it actually was. 
He had the encounter with the Lord, and because of that, God called out to him more clearly. I don't think you're getting that. When you have an encounter with the Lord, you will hear God's voice louder. But you have to have the encounter. And an encounter doesn't mean 20 years ago. An encounter means weekly, daily. If you are just encountering church, uh, Jesus in this church, that's great. But there is more to it. You have to be encountering him daily. You have to be going after him daily. Because when you go after him daily, when you encounter him more, when the Lord speaks, you know clearly that it is him and not something else. You know clearly. And then you can say, here I am. That's the first verse in this passage. The first verse. The encounter happened, and then Abraham said, here I am. Because he had that encounter before. If you haven't heard those messages, please go back on our YouTube. Go watch them. They are great. But because he had that encounter at the tents, because he had that place of where he met Jesus face to face, When Jesus called upon him, he answered. Come on, church. Like that, like I want that to get across. Like if you if you don't get anything else from this sermon, get this: that in order to know Jesus, you have to have encounters with him. But not on a Sunday morning. But on an everyday basis, you need to have encounters with him. On an everyday basis. And then what did Abraham do after this was told of him, that he has to get rid of his only son? Well, he woke up early the next morning and made preparations. Now, let me tell you something, and my parents can attest to this. I am not a morning person whatsoever. Mm -mm. (laughs) I probably shouldn't be saying this with them here, but like my prime time of getting stuff done in college was like 4 or 5 a.m. And that doesn't mean that I woke up at 4 or 5 a.m. to get the work done. That means I was up to 4 or 5. Now, maybe there was some pressure there because I had to get stuff done by my 8 a.m. classes. So mixed with a deadline and staying up all night, that, that was who I am. I am not a morning person. No matter the coffee, no matter the energy that I have waking up, as soon as I get in that car, it just, it, does anybody else feel the same way? Like you have energy waking up, you're like, today's going to be a good day. And then you start driving to work or you start driving to drop the kids off at school or you're starting to go to school and you're just like, oh Lord, <laughs> I need you today. It's going to be a rough one. Does anybody else feel that or am I the only one that has that problem? Okay. I am not a morning person. If you see me around the office at it all the times, I have coffee and then I have an energy drink because that's. I I need that energy in the morning. But something that we see here is that Abraham woke up early and made the preparations. Now, just think about this for a second. Abraham had just been told to sacrifice his son, the promised son, the one that was promised to Sarah. You know, as I would think like, I would be tossing, I would be turning, I wouldn't want to wake up, I wouldn't want to do anything. I, I, would, I would kind of be like, yo, Lord, can we schedule that for next week? Like, what if, that just doesn't fit my schedule. Um, I don't know if I can really do that. Uh, maybe we can try a little bit later. I feel like some of us would do that if the Lord called us to do a hard thing. But Abraham got up early and made preparations. And I think that's, something that goes a little bit unnoticed. If, if you're with me with youth or if you see the youth, you can ask them and they can tell you, I pick apart verses. We, t- we talk about the words that people kind of go over. But he woke up early. He made preparations for probably the hardest thing he ever had to do in his life. But it wasn't a night of excitement. There was probably emotion attached to it. And I also tell the students, like, when you read the Bible... Read the emotions that are with it. So think about this. You are a parent. You had just been told that your son, your favorite, and let's be real, there are favorites in every family, 
I'm not going to say if I am the one or not. My siblings will tell you that I am, but uh, everybody has a favorite. It just kind of happens that way. Pastor said last week, luckily, he has a favorite boy and a favorite girl, so he kind of gets away with that. But think about that. You have to, you get told the night before, hey, you have to go sacrifice your kid. You have to go sacrifice your favorite one. Just think about the turmoil that you would be in. Think about the pain, the hardship where you're just sitting there like, I know that if I deal with a difficult situation before I go to bed, I'm not sleeping. I'm, I'm just sitting there, I'm thinking about it, I'm overthinking about it, I'm analyzing from every direction, that is me. And I know there are some people in here as well, because if you have a hard decision, if you can go right to bed, please give me your superpower. I would love to have your superpower, that is considered a superpower, and I would love to have it. I can fall asleep anywhere, at any time, except if I am dealing with a hard thing. So, if you can, if you get like a hard news or something, and you're just like, yeah, I'm going to go to bed, please, Give me your superpower. I would love to have that. But he woke up early. The emotion with it. So he had this pain, this turmoil throughout the entire night. But yet he woke up early. He made the preparations. Verse 2, it says, Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah and go sacrifice him with a burnt offering. And once again, Abraham didn't go... I have a game, actually, tomorrow morning. Um, I can't do that. Uh, I have to go see a Red Sox game. Yeah, it's just in my schedule. Um, my favorite TV show is on, that is on TV land. That's obviously a rerun, but I have to watch it. There's some of you that are like that, and I know, it's okay. I grew up with TV land, too, so I watched all, like, Leave it to Beaver and um, Happy Days and all the other stuff, and it was just all reruns. And I was probably like six or seven when I realized like, oh, this is reruns. I've seen all these before. But people still watch them. And it wasn't this, I can't do this. I don't have time. He woke up and he went out. And then in verse 6 we see, So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulder, where he himself carried the fire and the knife. The two of them walked on together. Now, let me, let me just stop. Can you go back to verse 6, Don? I think it's the first one. Let me just kind of stop here for this. There's something funny about this passage. How many of you think that your parents had you just for physical labor? Am I the only one? Because here it says that Abraham gave Isaac the wood to carry. Now, let's be real. When, like, their altars, their burning offerings, stuff like that, that's not, like, a couple twigs. That's some wood. Like, that's a lot of wood. And Isaac had to go carry it. Meanwhile, Abraham carried the knife in the fire, a.k.a. a torch. We had a 12-bedroom inn growing up, and after we sold it, my grandma still like, had kind of a bit of the land, and all my friends loved coming over until they got put to work. So it wasn't just me that was born into physical labor. It became my friends were born into physical labor, too. I remember I had a friend who was like, we were staying the night, and we were laughing, and we were having a good time, and he looks at me, and he was like, you know, this would be a lot more fun if your grandma didn't ask us to do everything all the time. And by everything, I mean like mow the lawn, rake the lawn, clean the inside, clean the windows on the roof where she couldn't reach to, but sometimes she trusts teenagers to go out on the roof and clean the windows. I don't know why she did that, but she did. I don't know if you know that or not, but she had us go outside on the roof to clean the windows. Don't you love when your parents are around you and you tell stories and you're like, oh, I should probably, you don't know this. I should probably preference this. So I just find it funny that in this serious passage, we see a parent just being like, yep, you're carrying everything. I got the important stuff. Go ahead. You're okay. You're fine. It's okay. Just carry that entire weight. And I know there are some of you in here that when you were a kid, you felt the same way, that you were just born to carry the stuff, clean the stuff, do whatever your parents didn't want to do. Well, it's in the Bible, so it's okay. Anyways, <laughs> we have the fire in the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? And here's what Abraham says. God will provide us a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. And they both walked on together. So here's my second point. 
God will provide. Amen. Just, and I'm not preaching prosperity gospel. I hope you know that. I'm not. I am not preaching prosperity. I'm not saying that like the Lord will just take care of every one of your needs. He's going to buy you a $5 million mansion. No, that's not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that he will provide. But first, for that provision, you have to have that an encounter. Because if we are expecting something of God, but we don't have that relationship with God, how, logically, think logically, how, do, how is that going to happen? When we have the expectations that God will provide, but we don't act on it, we don't go forward with it, we don't try to meet him on an encounter. Pastor Brian said this the other day, that when you are in God's will, he's more likely to answer your prayers because you're in his will. How do you be in his will? You have an encounter with him daily. But he still will provide. When you think about the story before that we talked about last week with Ishmael, Ishmael was provided for even though he was not the chosen son. But Hagar spoke out and said, Lord, save my son. She had knew the Lord. She had encounters because of her masters. She had knew him. She developed that relationship herself with him so she could pray to take care of my son. And the Lord did. Listen, church, he will provide for what you need, whether that is healing, whether that is financials, whether that is relationship mending. He will provide it if we encounter him on a daily basis. And once again, this is not prosperity. This is the word. This is the word. This is what we're getting from this story. He will provide. Now think about this from Isaac's perspective. Isaac's like, sure, yeah, the Lord will provide. But he probably heard the stories. Uh, Dad is famous for his volcano stories where they start out like kind of small and mostly truthful. And then they kind of explode into pretty much non-truthful stories, just like multiple of exaggerations. I had that completely growing up. So I know what it's like for my dad to tell me stories. So imagine the stories that Isaac's hearing. Oh, I'm the chosen son. Oh, I'm, I'm the promised one. And not in like a cocky way, but like, obviously, if God is telling Abraham, you're going to be the father of many generations, Isaac's going to hear about that. So think about Isaac's shoes as well. Isaac had to have the encounters with God through his parents to also have the faith knowing that he will provide. But he didn't know what was happening. I saw a scholar say that Isaac in this passage had more faith than Abraham because he didn't know what was going to happen, and yet he still followed. Think about that. I told pastor that I was going to say this week so I could kind of have a scapegoat out of this, but the Lord really pressed this upon my heart. If you are a parent and you are wanting your child to obey, but you are not obeying the Lord, how do you expect them to obey? If you do not have a child, but if you have a niece or a nephew, or if you're a younger person, there's always somebody looking up to you. How do you expect them to obey if you are not encountering God, if you are not obeying God, Amen. if you are not having the faith? How do you expect them to do it if you're not going to do it? And just like here, he is walking with Abraham. He is having faith, knowing that God will provide. But he's listening. He's obeying. And it's something that had to be passed down before. So we see then in verse 9, when they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He replied, yes, here I am. Do not lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way. For now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your own son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in his place. 
Abraham named the place Yahweh Yireh, which means the Lord will provide. So because Abraham had his encounter, because he had his faith, and I told the students this past week, faith is 50% of the battle and 50% is a losing grade. It's a failing grade. When we have more faith, that grade starts to come up. But believing in God is only 50% part of it. And let's be real, if any of your kids walked home with a 50%, you'd be upset with them. One of them is shaking their heads no, but I definitely know for a fact that their parents would be upset if he came back with a 50%. Sorry, I just added you out. You're the only person here. But so, it's 50% of the battle. And if we held our kids to a high standard in school saying that you can't fail, why are we trying to fail with our walk with the Lord? If we are just doing 50%, if we are just believing, but we're not st taking steps of faith, if we're not walking on the daily encounters, we are having a failing grade with our relationship with Jesus. Now, if you do not know Jesus, 50%, that's a great starting point. <laughs> but if we are already part of his body, if we are already part of his kingdom, and yet we only believe, but we're not following out on the actions of this word, we are having a failing grade. But you see, Abraham here knew that something was going to happen. Actually, in Hebrews, it says that he thought God would bring him back from the dead, which is just when we think about it, we're like, oh yeah, Jesus did that. That's okay. But nowhere in the Bible was that talked about before. Nowhere before was it talked about that, Je that somebody would be risen from the dead. And yet Abraham had the faith that God was going to do something that had never been happened before. Think about that for a second. Because he had the encounter... He knew he would provide, but he knew he would provide in a way because he had the faith to continue to go forward. Church, are you getting that? He had the faith that the Lord was going to do something that had never been done. So don't you dare sit there and think, my burdens are too hard for the Lord. I can't be doing this because this has never been done before. This healing has never been happened in my body before. It can be done. Amen. The impossible is no longer the impossible with God. But once again, it goes back to the encounter. The encounter meets the provision. And then the faith acts upon your provision. But can we just imagine for a second? Once again, Isaac, we're in a broken family. Think about this. Think about the impact that this had on him. He probably went back home and Sarah was like, oh, how'd it go? How was the sacrifice? And Isaac was like, yeah, dad tried to kill me. That happened. Nobody's going to talk about it, but that, that happened. Dad tried to kill me. Have you ever had that like sibling that like, you know that when you get home and you're talking to your parents, one of you is going to get in trouble for what had happened? So you immediately point blame at the other one? I feel like Isaac kind of did that. Now, all my siblings are older than me, but I definitely had friends that when we would get in trouble, one in specific would just go, he did it. He would just walk in the door and go, he did it, and point at me. Why? I, I've asked him to this day. I go, why, why would you do that? Why would you throw me under the bus for something I never did? And he would go, somebody has to. And I'm like, but what? So imagine that conversation with Isaac. Imagine that time where he is just like, yeah, dad tried to kill me. He even tied me up. Like, I had to carry the wood. And then he tied me up on the wood that I had to carry. That's just disrespectful. <laughs> imagine that conversation. If we're talking about a broken home, imagine about the, concept, like the trauma that he may have had if God did not provide the ram. Now, something to note on that mountain and in that area, they're kind of like those little briar bushes. They call them thickets. Do you know what I'm talking about? The ones that like get stuck to your clothes and then they're on your clothes until you see them and you have to pull them off. And then they're always clumped together. There's never just one of them. Why? Why? Something when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask, why did you make briar bushes all clumped together? 
but you always have to like peel them off and pick them off one by one, and they're just annoying. That's the type of bush this was. So the ram got caught in it. And one thing to think as well, and scholars have debated this before, is was the ram always there and they never saw it? Or did it just have to be revealed by the angel? Was it a little bit further away and they saw it? Or did it just appear? Now, we don't know any of that. All we know is that because of Abraham's faith, the Lord provided. And not only his faith, his obedience. Church, the first time that talking about obedience or to obey in the Bible is this story. The first time. In Genesis chapter 22, we see the word obey for the first time. And it was spoken truly from the Lord, from an angel of the Lord. Now, how many of you know that even though you have daily encounters of the Lord, you still sometimes need that miraculous to come hit you square in the forehead? But he obeyed. He was about to do it. He was willing to do it because he knew that God would do something that was impossible before. Worship team, you can come back up. This brings me to my third point. Your obedience will affect your legacy. Let that sit for a second. Your obedience will affect your legacy. And I'm not talking just about you. I am talking about who comes after you as well. Because like I said before, if you are not obeying God's voice, if you are not obeying God's word, if you are not in his word encountering it, then you are setting a, not a good example for those for you to come. You see, Abraham had that example of faith to Isaac, which is why some scholars say that Isaac had more faith. He not only trusted his dad, knowing that it was gonna be good, knowing that it was gonna be okay, he had trusted God. How is your obedience with God affecting your legacy, not in your own life, but your family's legacy as well? Are you running away from the calling that the Lord has for you? Are you running away from the Lord because you are tired and filled with this guilt and you don't think that he can come and save you? Are you running away because you grew up in the church and you're like, it's part of my culture, but I've never really encountered him. Why do I still go? Are you running away? Your obedience will affect your legacy. And it will also affect the ones around you. Think about this church. I am here today because my dad answered that call when he was 16. Think about that for a second. I am visible proof that obedience to the Lord will affect the legacy. And that is not saying like, oh, Pastor Eddie, he's super egotistical, like thinking that he has a legacy. No, I am a second generation pastor because I had people that obeyed. I had people that had faith. Whew. Think about that. Think about the legacy that you have for the people around you, the kids that you have around you, your family members, those who do not know Jesus are also affected by your own legacy. Come on. But we have to start with the encounter to have the provisions and then we have to obey. Because if God sends us the provisions and we don't obey, then what are we doing with God's provisions? And I don't want this to just be about parents and because I don't think that is one thing of a legacy. Your legacy is your own legacy. How you are responding with the Lord, how you are affecting other people in your life, not just kids, but how you are doing that. Your legacy will be affected by your obedience to the Lord. Think about this. 
Abraham the entire time had been promised about his generations. The generations and generations will come after you. He had this promise before. He had the covenant before. But as we see here, it was given to him more because of his obedience. You see, the promise upon your life can already be there. But if you do not have the obedience on acting out on it, you will not receive the promises. God can have spoken into your life and told you that you are going to do amazing things. But if you do not have the obedience to follow up on that, you are wasting his provisions. And in then turn, there's a bunch of different biblical things. You are not being a good steward of it. But come on. When you think about it, when you think about your own selves, and yes, I want this to be a gut check. I want this to be hard to handle because I know that iron sharpens iron. And because we go through these things, because we go through these hard topics, this is actually two times in a row that I have talked about the hard things on a Sunday morning. But your obedience will affect not only your legacy, but the people around you. Think about those in your job that have never heard the name of Jesus before. Don, am I okay to share your story? Don went on the mission trip to the DR, was completely changed by it, had a presentation at TJX headquarters about her mission trip and the impact that it had. Her obedience to God allowed her to touch lives around her that may have never been touched by the Lord in a corporate setting. So I know some of you work in corporate and you're like, Pastor Eddie, I can't do that. I can't say the name of Jesus. I might get written up by HR. Somebody might come talk to me. Well, let them come talk to you. How is your legacy being affected by your obedience? How is your legacy being affected by your obedience? Because there is that encounter. And when we have that encounter and we have it more and more and more, we have that relationship. And then when we act on it more and more and more, and when we trust in God and we have that faith, we start getting more than a failing grade. We start getting up to 80s and 90s. And nobody will ever get 100% because we're not perfect, but we need to strive to be. Then the provisions will come. God will provide in ways that you have never thought in your life. God will provide and will take the impossible and make it possible. God will provide for you in the times and your darkest times. Think about this. Abraham was not a perfect man. Abraham lied to two nations about his wife being his sister. He lied to them. Abraham slept with another another woman. Yes, in biblical times, that's okay, but we kind of know that that's not. Abraham sent his son out into the wilderness. Not Isaac, but Ishmael. Abraham did so many terrible things. A broken family was redeemed by Jesus, by God. So I don't want you to tell me, oh, I can't have that encounter because I'm not perfect. I can't have that encounter because I've done some terrible things. I can't have that encounter because I'm afraid. Well, let me tell you something. When you have that encounter, all those thoughts go away. When you have that encounter, that true encounter with God, it goes away. All those fear, all those anxieties, all those pain, he takes it. A broken man, because he obeyed the Lord, after meeting him and encountering him, after knowing that he will provide, after having the faith, a broken man was obedient. And because he was obedient, his promises came true. Church, when you are obedient to what the Lord is speaking to you, his promises will come true. Notice how I didn't say your promises because we like to make up our own things like, Lord, I'll do this in like six weeks and then I can do it here. And then we have our own timeline. But how many of you know that that doesn't matter? Listen, your obedience, your obedience will fulfill God's promises. 
but it doesn't happen without your obedience. Yes, the Lord can still show up and do a miraculous things in people's lives without them even knowing Jesus. But church, you have a bigger burden. You have that bigger burden to carry the fire, to carry the encounter, to carry the obedience of what God is going to do in your life so that you can show the people around you. Listen, I pray for the students every single week that they would be a light in the places where they cannot shine, that their brightness would just shine completely to a point where that people would start asking questions. So why, and I heard some of you say, yeah, so why of you are so excited about that, but you're not excited to do it in your own life? Our students can be the light, that's fine. But what about you? What about you being the light in your world? What about you being the light in your work? What about you being the light in your neighborhood? It starts with the encounter. So as the worship team can, starts to play, I'm gonna pray over us. And I believe that the spirit of the Lord is here and not because me or Pastor Brian says so, but because we constantly invite him in every single day. I have said this repeatedly from this pulpit and I'll continue to say it. We cannot control the spirit of the Lord, but we can give him the invitation. So what about you? Here is your open invitation to encounter the Lord. Here is your open invitation to step up here and say, Lord, I will obey. Here's your invitation to step up and say, Lord, I know that you will provide. I have the faith. Give it to me, Lord. So as we pray, If you are somebody who just has never encountered Jesus, or if your well is drying up because you haven't encountered him in 20 years, I want you up here. I want you up here seeking the Lord. I want you up here trying to encounter him. And let me tell you, if you open up your heart to him, he will encounter you. But as humans, we put up that brick wall. As humans, our own egos get in the way of the encounter of Jesus. So that's the first thing. If if you have not encountered for a while, after I'm done praying, come up. The second thing is that if you need God to provide, whether that's healing, whether that's whether that's financial, whether that's marriage, whether that's relational, if you need God to provide, come up. Because then you can have the encounter and the encounter can have the provision. And then the third thing, if you're scared about your legacy, if you're scared about what God has for you, if you're running away from God's will, you need to be up here. If the Lord has spoken something into your life that you have been running away from, you need to be here. And you need to be praying for obedience. So after I pray, let us all stand. Can we all stand? So I'm going to pray. As I'm praying, after I'm done praying, please, let's fill these altars. Let's encounter Jesus. Let's have the obedience to take that first step. Let's have the obedience to walk out of your seat and encounter him. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all that you have done and all that you will do. Lord, I just pray today that we will encounter you, that your spirit would fall upon this place, that we would encounter you in a way that we never have before, that we would seek out after your name, that we would seek out after your obedience, that we would seek out after you, for that you will provide for everything, Lord. Lord, I just pray for these people in this congregation. I pray for that encounter with you. I pray that they would not go just for a Sunday, but that they would have that constant encounter with you on a Monday, on a Tuesday, as we go on with service, Lord. Lord, let us have an encounter with you. In your name we pray.